Good evening, everyone. <laughs> um, my name is Tracy Robinson. And I'm RF Bulkan. And we're a part, along with others who are here, of the Faculty of Law, the UE Rights Advocacy Project. Um, and we're here to set the stage for the panel and to tell you about um, a case which we were involved in in the context of the discussion of the panel. Um, firstly, can we say thank you to the EOC, um, to the chair, to all of the staff present, particularly uh, to Ria Mohammed Pollard, who did phenomenal work in um, preparing us for today. Um, and thanks to our co-sponsors, Kaiso, as well. Um, and, and all the panelists, <laughs> um, deeply appreciative of you being here, and those of you who have journeyed and are from the area and community, thank you also. Uh, so the case we're talking about is one named McEwan, for the first name litigant, Gulliver McEwan, um, who is from Georgetown, Guyana. And so the genesis of the case arose out of two separate arrests of seven, seven persons trans women in Guyana, in Georgetown, over a weekend. And they were both, these, all seven persons were arrested for various incidents, um, some what the police termed loitering. Uh, and in another instance, uh, three of them were pe actually pelted by members on the street because they were all dressed uh, dressed in female clothing and they were perceived as being male by members of the public. Um, they were the victims, they were the ones who were pelted, uh, but the police, uh, and because they retaliated uh, and they defended themselves, uh, the persons who were doing the pelting reported them to the police and they were arrested, detained over a weekend. Uh, they all claimed that um, they were not told why they were being arrested. Um, they got no information. They said the first time they knew what they were being charged with was on the Monday. They were being held on Friday night and Saturday morning and held over, over the weekend. And then on Monday, they learned that they were being charged with the offense of being a man dressed in female attire for an improper purpose, which was a vagrancy offense in Guyana from 1893. And in fact, prior to that occasion, I mean, there had been sporadic incidents of the police using this law, but this was the first time um, it, had ever been, it had ever been used to completion, meaning they were taken to court. Um, and remember, they were ostensibly arrested, and this is important, they were ostensibly arrested because there were allegations against them that they had been um, involved in a fight in, in Georgetown. And when the police could get, and there were, uh, there were allegations as well that they had stolen money um, from in the course of the fight. But of course, there was no evidence against them. And at the end of this weekend, so they were kept in custody for three days um, at the Breakdown Police Station in appalling conditions. In fact, they recounted that when, um, they, were taken, when they were taken to the police station, they were made to strip. The police said, take off your clothes and um, if, uh, ensure that they, their families brought them male clothing. And so it was only when they got to court they heard this offense for the first time. Nothing came up about stealing or creating a disturbance or loitering. Uh, what they were presented with was this very um, unusual charge of being dressed in female clothing in a public place for an improper purpose. Just to say that they were all then charged together and the trial was all in aggregate. Um, all of them were tried together, even though they were arrested in different parts of the city, in different circumstances entirely. Um, we, we wanted to, to share the story of Isabella, who was 15 at the time of the arrest. She's now 26 years old. Isabella Passad is the youngest of the four persons who ultimately litigated. At 13 years, I saw dress in female attire because um, I realized when I put it on, I feel comfortable. Truly, I never went to school. I told myself that um, if I didn't get education, I want my sisters and my brother to get. So I decided to come on the streets, sell black bag. You know, from black bag, I decided to beg on the streets. A period of time, I was in drugs because of poverty, stress, and 
money incoming and stuff like that. I think we has been treated the same way, like we always treated like trash. Because, um, let me say, we go to the station for Mecca report that I was walking down the street and this guy just shied me with a buckle. When you go to the station, they don't want to hear that. But if a man go to the station and said this homosexual harass him or trouble him or disrespect him, they're going to want to come and chuck you up, shy you in the van and you have to pay them a fine, $10,000. If you don't have that $10,000, you have to go to court and all these things. I want to be, go to court and treated the same way another human being could be treated. If I, as a prisoner, could give you your respect while you're on your bench, while you can't give me my respect, why is I am in court, you know, caught up? So Isabella tells us a few things about who she is um, and asking that that be respected. She tells us about the stresses of her life, uh, being a poor woman, trans woman, being socially excluded, treated like trash, um, the everyday discrimination she faces. And, and her story is not unusual in terms of what she said to you. Uh, no education, so didn't go to school, um, couldn't get decent work. Um, so she was selling, vending in the streets more or less. And as she said, the stresses of all of that led to her, you know, her life on the street at times, taking drugs. Uh, she tells us about the lack of state protection, the disrespect by state officials and the society at large. She alludes, um, as Ari said, to the lack of education, decent work. Um, she describes in this conversation being homeless as well at different points, all raising questions about a dignified life. So maybe also notice that Isabella is also signaling to us something about how the criminal justice system worked in her case. Seven persons tried together, completely different instances. Um, these mass trials, very little evidence. In fact, there was no evidence um, presented of significance in the case. Uh, I think we have lost the audio again. Um, we also notice high rates of guilty pleas um, to get out of the system in these lower courts. I mean, so. <clears throat> What happened in their case was, as, as I explained earlier, they had been arrested for a completely trivial charge or trumped up charges. They had spent an entire weekend in police custody, stripped of their clothing, their dignity. They did describe to us how they were not provided with any food or refreshment and the conditions of the cell, and they were unrepresented. And, and that's one of the fundamental things with these minor charges as opposed to the more major ones, yes. where representation is always present. But here, here they're, they're seen as very trivial charges. So that's where the police have the most enormous powers and enormous discretion over you. So they got to court unrepresented and simply did what anyone would do who was poor and unrepresented and just wanted to escape the hellish conditions under which they were held, which was to simply plead guilty. Mm -hmm. And that's not an uncommon narrative in these kinds of situations. Mm -hmm. So the Caribbean Court of Justice last November uh, heard an appeal from four of the persons who had been arrested and convicted who challenged the constitutionality of the law. We should also say that when they went to the magistrate's court, the magistrate said to them, you're confused about your sexuality. You are men, not women. You should go to church and find Jesus. Um, and that was also part of the context of the litigation before the court. So the CCJ agreed entirely with the case presented on behalf of the four persons. They said the law was too vague. Who knew what improper purpose meant? How were you to understand male and female attire? And persons could not tell in advance what they were being prohibited from doing. And ultimately, that gave the police wide discretion to discriminate. They also said by a majority that the law violated their freedom of expression, their right to dress in the way in which was uh, consistent with their own identity and their equality. And they also, by a majority, said that the remarks of the magistrate were inappropriate and compromised their right um, to a fair hearing by an impartial tribunal. Within the decision, there are many other things the courts say which we think are connected to the idea of a dignified life. Um, they say, for example, a society that promotes respect for human rights, 
is one which supports human development and the realization of the full potential of everyone. The decision begins with this passage, a powerful one from the president um, of, the, of the CCJ, Justice Saunders, differences as natural as breathing. Infinite varieties of everything exist under the sun. Civilized society has a duty to accommodate suitably differences amongst us as human beings. Only in this manner do we give due respect to everyone's humanity. No one should have his or her dignity trampled upon or their human rights denied merely on account of a difference, especially one which poses no risk to public order or to public safety. Arif? He continued, discrimination by reason of a condition which is inherent and integral to his or her identity and personhood undermines the dignity of persons, severely fractures peace and erodes freedom. And Quoting your own Jamada, Justice of Appeal, Jamadar. And, and this, is, this is Justice of Appeal, Jamadar now, soon to be of the CCJ, but it was then when he was in the High Court in what we call the Trinity Cross case. Um, in a case in which the courts invalidated uh, the use of the Trinity Cross as an appropriate, um, an appropriate national honor in a diverse society. Um, very important judgment in which Justice Jamadar is explaining that to discriminate in this way wounds dignity and actually compromises democracy and peace and freedom in the society. They also say throughout the case that the core of the idea of equality and non-discrimination is dignity. Human dignity is the essence and autonomy to decide for yourself what you want to do with your life is the core of human equality. So we also wanted to quickly um, point to some of the ways in which we hear the inter-American court using the idea of what they call vida digna, the dignified life. Um, and we hear them saying the right to life can't be restricted simply to the right to not have your life taken away arbitrarily. And often that's the way in our constitutions um, it's presented, so in a negative sense. Um, the police aren't supposed to take away your life or the state isn't supposed to take away your life. Yes. Um, that's it, but this um, envisages a more positive, a more, a more a fuller, a more fulsome obligation on the state. It means that you should not only have the right not to have your life taken away arbitrarily, but you should have the right to access the conditions that guarantee a dignified life, is this idea of what the right to life means. It includes the right to self-determination, the right to make your own choices, to choose the options you feel best for your life in order to achieve your ideals. And it also means a dignified life that one must address the things which are going to interfere with your ability to have a dignified life, which include violence, injustice, discrimination, which can interfere with our ability to realize our goals and ambitions for our own life project. So, so that would, just briefly, that would mean not just the state not taking away your life, but having in place the conditions and the procedures and processes that would also prevent other citizens from impacting upon your peaceful life or taking away your life. So the state's obligation is seen as wider than not just simply taking away your life. And then finally, there's a comment at a forum we held the day the court heard, the CCJ heard this case in June of last year. And this is um, Shelley Ann Tenia, the rector and dean of the cathedral um, in Porto, Spain, the Anglican church. She said, there are some things that are common about us in our humanity. Uh, trying to make meaning, seeking what is best for us in our own lives and the lives of people we love, hoping that we'll all experience dignity and respect, knowing that there is a place for us. Even if we're different or if we're born into vulnerable space, the hope that someone will contribute to the evening out of this playing field. And finally, let's end with um, also, Isabella. again, Isabella. I will love the, um, the government of Guyana to legalize 
trans people rights because um, I don't know if I'm gonna live for a couple more years but maybe the young generation might get to enjoy it sitting there in the courtroom and getting to hear the case and stuff like that I felt so nice because um, you know I didn't get to speak but my voice has been heard you know if I had a chance to speak with the, um, the judges I would just ask the judges to just think about talking to me and talking to one of your family, you know, so everyone deserves a chance in life. And this is not, you're dealing with animal, you're dealing with human being, you know. But she ends by saying, you're not dealing with animals, you're dealing with human beings. I want this court to imagine that when they're talking about me and to me, they're talking to a member of their family, another human being. And so this is a key message about what a right to a dignified life means, being treated like a human being. But I or just, just wanted to say, I mean, this is Isabella, the youngest litigant um, in this case. And she's talking about, this is, she's talking about, I, I just wish, if it, I can't enjoy it, the younger generation. Now, she herself is young, um, but it gives you a sense of, the, of how much, or how excluded, uh, you know, Isabella and those in her community live, uh, you know, because of all of the state failures in relation to, the, in relation to them. And it's also a way in which Isabella is telling us how her right to a dignified life has been compromised, that she doesn't have an expectation that she will actually live to see change and to be able to realize her goals. So, you know, we, we think a right to a dignified life means being treated with respect, not being treated like a second class citizen, not being treated like animals. Um, we think it means recognizing differences amongst us, that we're not all the same and should be able to choose the lives we wish to have. We think it means as well, not simply just the right to life or the state taking, not taking away your life, but as well addressing the social and economic rights to health, education, decent work, among others, that will enable you to live a dignified life. And we also think it means ending discrimination, violence and injustice, which significantly compromise our life project. Thank you very much.